Hello and welcome. Today we're talking to Kelly Vincent, the wonderful Kelly Vincent. From 2010 to 2018, Kelly Vincent was a member of the South Australian Parliament for the Dignity Party. In this role, she achieved a number of major reforms, including the Disability Justice Plan, a nation leading change in how the justice system responds to disabled victims, witnesses and offenders, and funding for the establishment of South Australia's first centre of excellence for the treatment of border personality disorder and the intensive home-based support service, preventing and shortening mental health related hospital admissions. Now Kelly pursues her passions for disability, mental health, broader social and economic equality and the arts through her freelance work as a speaker and writer. In 2017, Kelly was awarded the Zonta Club's Women of Excellence Award for Excellence in Human Rights. She lives in suburban Adelaide with Cosmo, a robot unaware of his own magnificence, and Daisy, a cat prone to overestimating hers. <laughs> Welcome, Kelly. And I will just note as well that you were the first... Um, a woman who uses a wheelchair to be elected to any Australian parliament. And I that's, think that's right. Also worth mentioning. Um, Thank you very much. So I do note these things. Um, fantastic. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So how did you end up doing what you're doing? Um, essentially, uh, back in 2008, 2009, I was having trouble getting a new wheelchair that I needed at that time because of lack of funding and supports available to measure me for that chair and so on. I'm sure a lot of your viewers would be familiar with that situation, so I won't outline it because we have to end this interview sometime in the next three months or so. Um, but because of that experience, I started lobbying ministers and speaking at conferences and forums and on radio about that experience and what I believe needed to change is that, of course, no person in 21st century Australia should be going so long without something as fundamental and basic and necessary as a wheelchair. And it was through that lobbying that I met Dr. Paul Collier, who ran the Dignity Party at the time. And he asked me to stand as uh, the number two candidate uh, for the Dignity Party or Dignity for Disability, as it was then. And I, of course, agreed because I, I thought it was a really worthy cause trying to up the, the social and political voice of, of disabled people in our community. And so uh, I'm very happy to agree to that. Uh, long story short, Dr. Paul Collier, unfortunately, died nine days out from election day. And given that he was our number one candidate for that election, um, I took his place as, uh, in the number one spot for that candidacy and was subsequently elected. So it was obviously an experience that I wish had come about in very, very different ways, but one that um, was amazing and has made such a change not only to my life, but um, so many others as well, and an absolute honour to serve in that. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't re-elected, as you pointed out, in the last state election here in South Australia, just gone. So now I am uh, continuing to lobby on a freelance basis. I still have a lot of contacts within the parliament that assists me to do that. Um, and I'm also working as a public speaker and have just uh, won a new position as well in the education department. So, uh, yeah, life is, is changing a lot, but it's just as exciting and busy. Fantastic. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I spoke to, to Jordan Steele John recently, and he had a similar kind of almost accidental path to election. <laughs> you know, is this, is this the only way people with disabilities can end up in Parliament? <laughs> is this kind of by accident? How else do we do this, Kelly? I, I don't think it is the only way, but I think it is common because I think when you are, particularly when you are born with a disability, you almost become like a disability rights activist by way of your birth. And so you take all these avenues to fight for your own rights and those of others that kind of eventually, if you're very lucky, lead you to paths like formal politics and others. Um, but certainly it should not be the only way. Um, and that's why I think we do need to look at things like proportional representation um, and other measures to make sure that our political voice is a lot more equal, not just for disabled people, but for a lot of other groups as well, because ultimately, the parliament is there to represent the people. And we can't do that adequately if all we have representing us are, forgive me, but pale, stale male, you know, middle-aged male lawyers. And um, so I'm really all for getting people of different ages, different genders, different um, employment backgrounds. It's so important to, 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 to further that, I think. Yeah, it, it's interesting too, because there's a, a, a number of people in the frontline activism space um, 
you know, where many of us have, have worked a lot of our time, including you, um, and in fact, Jordan, when I was talking to him. But, um, you know, it's a very different thing than going into politics. And many people are nervous about whether that involves selling out or becoming a different person fundamentally. How did you find that experience from shifting from activism to, to the chamber? I think... I think in some ways, you know, I think about this a lot, Christina, I still can't quite articulate it properly. By going in, you know, being elected quite unexpectedly at the age of 21, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of idea of the rules of parliament and I wasn't, you know, I don't come from a legal background. And so in lots of ways that was disadvantageous because I had to learn very quickly how to operate in that world. But in other ways it was very advantageous because it meant that I was coming with, with a fresh perspective and that I was still very much connected to that grassroots activism community background that I had come from. And I think that that really served me well in that role as opposed to someone who's maybe started off there but 20 years ago and then got into a union or you know law or something for much more kind of corporate in a sense and they've lost some of that grassroots connection so I think there really was an advantage in having the way that I did, even though there were certainly some struggles um, that came along with it. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, that I guess coming back to the point that I was making previously, the only way we can have truly represented parliament is we have people from all different walks of life in that parliament. And I think having people coming from that more community-based background that actually have real connections in the community. And, you know, I think, I think everybody goes into it um, wanting to make positive change. I think everybody goes into it for the right reasons. We might all have different ideas about what the right reasons are um, and exactly what the, those outcomes might be. But we all go into it making change. But I think if you go into it to be a politician, if you go into it that this is your career and this is your space and you are, you know, a career politician, you will quickly lose sight of, of those original reasons that you went in if you're not careful. And so I think actually having more people come in from that grassroots background is, is really powerful. Mm. And it is something you, you really did do quite a lot of during your time in Parliament was stay connected to the disability community right across Australia, not just in South Australia, although you were clearly very active there. But um, but you were you know very engaged with with us all around the country and and you know, did you find that to be an important grounding or, a, a, you know, did it actually provide you with a certain amount of insight into the big issues in disability that you wouldn't otherwise have had? I think it did give me a lot of insight. And it also gave me a, a deep sense of um, connection and, and duty because, you know, I think often members of parliament stand up and talk about issues that are important, but they're not necessarily directly affected by themselves, whether it be, you know, Aboriginal issues or LGBTIQ community. Often, and of course, there are Aboriginal and LGBT members of parliament, but not enough of them, I would argue. Um, so even if they're coming from a good place in their heart and in their intention, they don't have that same connection. And I think having an actual connection to the community gave me even more of a drive to affect those changes because ultimately I was not just talking about people in my general geographic community, even though that would be reason enough. I was literally talking about my own family, my own friendship circle and, and myself to some extent too. So I think it was a, a great drive. And I mean, you know, the disability community um, worldwide really, but particularly here in North Australia, has given me so much in terms of mentorship and friendship and community and a sense of belonging that I also felt this great sense of duty to, to give back that as much as I could um, because I think that particularly now that a lot of those people who um, provided me with that mentorship in my younger years are getting that bit older, I think we really need to make sure that we are um, and building that next generation of of leaders in our community and god that sounds so cliche doesn't it but it's it's true you know so so i think part of the the connection of that was knowing that i had people i could lean on but also 
knowing that I wanted to become a, people, a person that people could lean on as well. Mm. And I'm aware that, it, you know, I've, I've worked in mainstream places where, you know, you're the only person with disability in the room and that can be quite isolating. And um, you were in the same situation in the upper chamber of the South Australian Parliament. I'm just wondering how you manage to get outcomes when you're in that sort of isolation, that, that, that only person kind of role. Yeah, it was really interesting. I think particularly when I first came to the parliament and I was so different from the majority of other members in terms of, you know, threefold really, I was young, I was a woman and I was obviously disabled. Um, and so there was, for the first couple of weeks really, even things like people would come and knock on my door and, you know, but it became very evident that they just kind of wanted to say hello and get a sense of me and what I was because they hadn't really dealt with anyone who was what I am before. And so it was this sort of morbid fascination that I found really interesting. And also, you know, um, journalists asked me questions in interviews like, how do you go to the toilet? You know, where you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask any able-bodied person that interview that question in an interview. So this weird kind of morbid fascination around um, my disability and assumptions that were made too around that I wouldn't be able to make outcomes because you know I was only one person and I wouldn't be able to sit through the late nights um, in Parliament when actually I'm probably more able to stay up later than some of the older people. To be completely honest. Um, so yeah, all these kind of assumptions. Um, and I sort of had to have this conversation with myself in my head where I thought, I can either get really pissed off about this and annoyed about all these assumptions that people are making about me, and I can get really angry about it. But if I do that, I won't get out of bed, you know, because I'll wake up way down by all crap in my head, you know. So the best way we can do it is by example and by showing people that you can do stuff. And, you know, I would joke with people about my disability. I'd make jokes that made them a little bit un uncomfortable with them. They would understand that they could laugh with me and I was a human being and we'd go on with it, you know? Um, so in terms of being the only person kind of in that situation and the only person in my party, the only par parliamentary representative of the party so far, I think, um, Sorry. But that's all right. I'll have one too. I think, it, <laughs> I think it's interesting insofar, again, it comes back to that previous point I made of you can either look at this as a disadvantage that you're only one person and there's so much, only so much you can do. But there's also bits of it that are advantageous because, for example, as a crossbencher member of parliament, you essentially have to work with other parties to get your, your idea across the line and your legislation passed because you don't have the numbers within your own party to just get things rubber stamped. But it was working through with those other parties that you often find perspectives that you wouldn't have thought of yourself, you know. So you might have people agreeing to the concept, but saying, oh, what about this, what about this group of people, what, about, what are we going to do for, um, you know, deaf people or whatever it is, I don't know, um, people from different cultural backgrounds and you go, oh yeah, good point. And, actually work through collaboratively to get a better outcome. And it's sort of a, a secret of the trade in lots of ways that actually often what you see on question time where we're all yelling, yelling and pointing and screaming at each other, that's the show of it. But the actual great outcomes are when we all sit down together, have a cup of tea and say, look, we all agree that something needs to change. We'll have different perspectives and different ideas about exactly maybe what needs to change. Let's get together and actually find that middle ground and find the best outcome for everyone uh, in as much as possible. And that is the challenge that I really enjoyed. Um, and I think the disability justice plan was a great example of that where I started off and just by way of background for your viewers slash listeners, um, they, the way this came about was I had families come to my office who had seven children who were allegedly sexually abused by their school bus driver at the time. This was about six, six, seven-ish years ago now. Politics, you lose all your sense of time, it ages you terribly. But, um, and they, those children were not able to give evidence in court because some of them were not uh, needed to communicate in ways other than speaking, so non-verbal, mm. um, or um, had very limited 
communic uh, like uh, vocabulary. That's the word I'm looking for. That's an ironic word to forget. Um, or it needed to communicate through sign or assistive technology. And so the court and police at that time didn't necessarily have um, the way the methods in place to support that. So um, they were labelled what's called an unreliable witness, and the case um, was originally um, dismissed. And so I said, "There's, there's got to be something. You know, there's, there's, there's clearly something that has happened to you. Okay, they can't necessarily remember dates and places or, or times that the abuse allegedly took place. But for heaven's sake, one of the boys walked into the classroom one morning, pulled his pants down, took a teacher aside, pointed at his penis, and said the bus driver's name, ouch. Now, of course, that doesn't prove guilt one way or another, but it does prove that something's going on here that needs to be worked through, and that these kids have a story that needs to be listened to. So I started researching um, what's in place in, in other states here in Australia and also what's available um, overseas in terms of supporting disabled witnesses to give evidence. And I found a number of really interesting um, programs, particularly in Victoria and in, in the UK. And I thought, well, for heaven's sake, if not only the UK, but Victoria right across the border can do it, let's get this done. So I started researching and talking to people who work as what they're called intermediaries um, in, uh, in the UK but we call them communication partners here in South Australia. So they have specialised training to work with someone to facilitate their communication and to facilitate that conversation between, say, a judge and, uh, and themselves or, or a police officer and themselves. And we actually went from the point at which lawyers and magistrates were saying to me, to my face, you know, nothing's going to change. The legal system is the way it is. It's the way it is because we, if we start messing around with the rules, that it will be too, um, you know, too flexible. And, you know, because rightly so, the legal system has to have certain balance, you know, for people on all sides, victims, offenders, witnesses. Um, but it took me five years, but I got us to the point where not only was I changing lawyers' minds on that, but I was changing other members of Parliament's minds on that. I actually had the new Chief Justice willing to meet with me in person right before Christmas. You know, now it's unheard of to, you know, for this young upstart with no legal knowledge to get a meeting with the Chief Justice at all, let alone right before Christmas. But I think because I've been making those arguments kind of unemotional, unemotionally, based on fact, based on what needed to change in a convincing manner. That's what brought people along. Um, again, using that lived experience and that connection to community as well. So I was essentially assisting the Attorney General's Department to run workshops with disabled people to hear about their experiences with the um, educate, with, sorry, Education Department justice system. Uh, my mind's always in a few different places at once, sorry. Um, and um, how, you know, to make sure that those workshops were accessible, that the information they were putting out was accessible. So, you know, it's, again, putting aside all that, he said, she said, bullshit, frankly, you know, because our party does this and your party does that, and actually working together. Because at the end of the day, human beings are human beings, and our needs don't fit ne neatly into the Labour Party or the Liberal Party or the Dignity Party. Actually, it's everyone's responsibility. And I used to say when I was in my role that one of my biggest goals was to make myself redundant because I believe that if our parliament was truly representative and working functionally, we wouldn't actually need a specific party working on the rights of disabled people or LGBTIQ community members or Aboriginal people, whatever it might be. Sure, we would be collaborating with those communities and doing so in a respectful, communicative open, accessible way, but it's actually everyone's responsibility because everyone benefits, as in the Disability Justice Plan example. Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, it's was, it was terrific. And while I'm hearing you talk about that, I'm, I'm interested in the dynamics, the power dynamics, because clearly the fact that you were an elected person, that you were in the room, gave you a certain stature that it would have been it would have been extremely different if you were simply another activist out in the community what how did that pan out i mean, i guess i guess the first thing i'd like to say is it really shouldn't be that different 
And I think that that's indicative of one of our problems with politics in this country at the moment is that it's not open to everyday people and that's why people become so disenfranchised with the system because all they see is us carrying on and screaming and yelling at each other and insulting each other. Whereas, you know, we don't necessarily talk about, you know, I sat down with Kelly and I talked about this really important justice system, education system, health system issue, whatever, because we're all so wrapped up in taking credit for, you know, this project and this, this bill and this piece of legislation. So one of the things that I think was really helpful, and I'd love to see uh, more members of Parliament utilise it, I think that will, as time goes on, because hopefully they'll have no choice. But I think social media actually played a really, a really big role in that. Because you probably saw, I uh, might have seen, I've got a few videos on my page where I actually sit down and talk to people who are directly affected by a policy change that I either have affected or was trying to affect at the time. So, you know, um, one that sticks in my mind is one that I did with this amazing young guy called Aaron, who has a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. So I got him to sit down with me and say, talk me through what treatment works for you, talk me through what BPD is, what you respond to, what you don't, and what you actually need from treatment. You know, because for too long, BPD, I mean, all mental illnesses are a bit like this, but BPD particularly, People are, are, it's not real, it's not, you know, it can either respond to this treatment or it can't be treated at all rather than being flexible. So I really tried to provide that community voice and tried to remind members of parliament that there are people out there that are directly affected. And in fact, they might have some advice for you that will help you make this a better, better policy. So I think um, having that kind of attitude of being, I don't care what side you're on, side you know of politics i don't care whether we might vehemently disagree on other issues and we did but you know we've got something to offer each other on this issue so whether it's your name that gets up on this bill on this amendment whatever you know let's sure we can give each other credit in our speeches but it's not about because ultimately no one's going to be flicking through the an amendment or a bill you know 50 years down the track saying gee i wonder who introduced this it's about what change did this make and how did it affect people's lives? So that collaborative kind of approach based in that activism, I think was really helpful, but it did, it did take a while to solidify that, I think, both in, in myself, I think it took, um, it took a long time um, for me to even believe that I belonged in Parliament and that I was worthy of being there. I think particularly because of the circumstance I, I came, in which I came to be there kind of being coincidental and a twist of fate and whatever you might like to see as. It took a long time for me to kind of take ownership of that role. Um, and my staff played a, a really big role in that because I was really lucky to somehow find staff that even though I'd never been in politics before, that most of my staff had worked in, in politics with different member, members of parliament for about 20 years each. And so, and for whatever reason, they wanted to work for me. And I just felt so lucky because they had all this knowledge that I could, I could use, that I could draw on um, and, and learn from uh, without having to necessarily fill the shoes of being that legal person myself. And so that gave me the time to, to, to build my own kind of, pers not persona because, it, well, you know, it sounds like it wasn't really me. It was really me in there all the time, but my own sort of skill set and, and confidence knowing that I had them backing me up with all the legal stuff and the logistics. So um, it did take a really, a really big time, but I think there was sort of this turning point and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the only one, but I remember giving an interview um, with someone after my, it's called the maiden speech, inaugural speech, whatever you want to call it, first speech in Parliament. First speech, yeah. And, uh, um, uh, and a journalist was interviewing me about it. And the last question she asked me was how long have you been working on that speech now the truth of the matter was i finished at about two o'clock morning i was supposed to give it because that's just how my brain works i kind of stew on it stew on it stew on it and then sit down and write it down but the answer that came out of my mouth and it amazed me when it came out of my mouth said i said i've been working on that my whole life and i don't think i realized until then how true that was that all of my experiences 
fighting for stuff for myself, for my family, my friends had kind of added up to this. And that's what made me qualify, you know, and it wasn't, I think it wasn't until then that it really started to dawn on me. And it took another, probably another year or two before I really felt confident in that role. But again, I think that that's what gave you so much advantage too, was that I wasn't coming in there because I thought I'd earned a seat because I'd served a union and I'd been a faithful liberal labor you know family first whatever greens person but because i'd had this life experience that 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 served me well and i had my staff and my community hopefully most of the time backing me up and and that's what that's what helped me yeah it, it's interesting because what you're really um i'm hearing from you there is that you know you are certainly even if you're the elected person um, you are not there on your own. You've got you've got to have a team around you, and you've got to collaborate. There's a lot of networking, a lot of um, partnering with people that you might never have sat down with otherwise. It really is a combined effort. Absolutely, as with any change, you know, um, the fight for women's right to vote didn't come because one woman said, you know, I'd like to vote, please. The fight for racial equality. Or ongoing though it is didn't start with you know a woman sitting in a bus and refusing to move you know that one woman may have been a catalyst for particular movements but you know it, it takes it takes a team and, and I think um what's really important too is to recognize um almost recognize that the I don't have my words with me today sorry Christina that the um be, be, be open to continual learning without surrendering yourself. Like, you know, don't, don't every idea someone tells you say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry, I was wrong on that, you know, because you might not be. It might just be that someone has a different um, um, opinion. That's democracy. But be open to knowing that you might not always have a right the first time and that there are stuff, there is stuff that you might not know, particularly me going on at, into that role so young. It was like, oh, I need to find older Crips, you know, older, my family, my community that I can talk to, put me through. What have I missed? What, what, what background do I need to have? So that community is, is really, really important. And I think it's really, it's, it's too, it's too easy to forget that everyone has that. You know, I used to have people say to me stuff like, um, I remember once this person used to comment on my Facebook. Uh, semi-regularly saying things like oh you know clearly you've never worked a hard day in your life and you come from a, a um you know a, a privileged family to family of lawyers and all stuff like mate like you know like, I'm 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 the only person in my family to have finished year 12 let alone done it non-modified you know like I could tell you lots of things about my background that are not rosy you know and I think, I think it's very easy to look at someone on the TV or hear them on the radio and think, oh, they're confident, they've, you know, but what they don't know is that half an hour before that, and she was, you know, basically always on the floor crying to myself, going, I can't do it, I'm not doing it, no, 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 no. But then, but see, they were brilliant in that they knew me and they, they knew I just needed to have that moment of, get over it, and then I'd go on and do it. So they just sit there and listen and say, oh, yeah, I reckon you can, I can't, I can't do it. So, you know, I think it's too easy to think that people, I mean, of course, anyone can sound confident in a 30 second soundbite, you know, anyone can fake it for 30 seconds, but it's all that kind of, it's like the duck on the water, you know, and the legs behind it kind of badly scrambling to remember that statistic and remember it. So, you know, there's that cliche of no person is an island, but it's, it's totally true. And I've been so lucky to have such amazing people not only be part of my community, but often offer to be part of my community that to me is the privilege yeah that's fantastic we are almost out of time but i'd just like to ask you to finish up today who's the leader you admire and why um if i had to pick one and it's difficult to pick one obviously you yeah. pick one it's only the one <laughs> okay i would say um, my mum and i know it's a cliched example but honestly she has three kids two of whom um with disabilities my brother has an intellectual disability and epilepsy and um, needs a lot of support um, because of that. Um, so she had the two of us going through school, or three of us going through school, by paying school fees by working at least two jobs at a time, being so tired that she'd sometimes admit to falling asleep at the steering wheel for a little nanosecond as she was driving us home, but never let on how hard it was. And also never um, let us accept anything lesser never let like 
um, I remember one example where my um, my class in year six was going to the beach for an excursion. And apparently, I don't remember this, but my teacher had rung my mum and said, of course, you understand why we can't take Kelly with us to the beach. And she just said, no, I don't understand that at all. Let me be very clear. Kelly goes to the beach or nobody goes to the beach. You know, she used to do all this stuff that was really embarrassing that at the time, I go, oh, mom, can you just, can you just not, you know? And she turned to me and she said, one, one day you're going to understand why I do all this stuff because one day you're going to have to do all this stuff yourself. And I, when I, it was sort of when I started getting more in, into activism and even more so politics, and I went, oh, yeah, she knew. She knew what she was doing. So, yeah, she's my absolute role model she's she's mad as a cut snake but she's my role model so fantastic oh kelly vincent thanks so much for making time for us today it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for listening to my incredibly long answers that's the politician in me <laughs> it's been terrific thanks kelly thanks christina have a great day